Brother, I'm Dying by Edwige Dantica. Chapter 20, titled Tomorrow. My father's rough patch had continued. He was becoming agitated, panicked at times over his decreasing ability to speak for extended periods. His anxiety sent us on a renewed search. During his monthly visit to Dr. Padman, Bob asked if he could be considered for any experimental treatment programs and procured a referral to a pulmonologist at Columbia Presbyterian in Upper Manhattan. Suddenly my father had a place and a time on which to pin his hopes. He was looking forward to his appointment that he would uh, end each of our brief conversations by saying, we'll see what they tell me at Columbia. On Saturday morning as my father struggled for breath and dreamed of Columbia, I had to tell him that his brother was at Chrome, a place that he, like all Haitians, knew meant nothing less than humiliation and suffering, and more often than not, a long period of detention before deportation. So it's true, he said. Uncle Frank had called the night before to tell him that Uncle Joseph might be going there. I hate to put this on you, my father said. You're pregnant, but you're the only family he has down there. It's in your hands. I told him that Fedo and I had already called a few immigration lawyers, and they'd all advised us that there was nothing we could do before Monday morning. You mean, my father said, uncle has to spend the whole weekend in jail? When he arrived at Chrome, my uncle was lined up with a dozen or so other detainees and his briefcase inventoried and taken away from him. A Chrome property inventory form lists one soft cover religious book, his Bible, 1,000 U.S. dollars, he was allowed to keep the nine dollars to buy phone cards, one airline ticket, one tube of Fixident for his dentures, and two nine-volt batteries for his two voice boxes. Again, there's no mention of the herbal medicine or the pills he was taking for his blood pressure and inflamed prostate. My uncle's initial medical screening involved an examination of his vital signs, chest x-rays, and a physical and mental history interview. In the notes jotted down by the examining nurse, he is described as composed, friendly, and purposeful. To the question, does the detainee understand and recognize the significance and symptoms of the situation in which he finds himself, the nurse answers, yes, adding elsewhere, patient uses a traditional Haitian medicine for prostate and says he doesn't take it, uh, if he doesn't take it, he pees blood and has pain. Ross Nock, a spokesman for U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, would later derogatorily refer to my uncle's traditional medicine as, quote, a voodoo-like potion. At the end of his first day at Chrome, my uncle's blood pressure was so high that he was assigned to the short-stay unit, a medical facility inside the prison. He and Maxo were separated. I am acquainted with Ira Kurzban, author of Kurzban's Immigration Law Sourcebook, one of the most widely used immigration manuals in the United States. Ira had represented Haitian immigrant clients for more than 30 years and had worked as general counsel to the governments of Panama, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Haiti, and as former President Aristide's attorney. On the recommendation of a mutual friend, I called his office early Monday morning and asked for his help. I'm sending one of my best guys on this, he said, after I explained the entire situation to him. Because of his age and health condition, we'll first try to get your uncle out as soon as possible. Soon after Ira hung up, John Pratt, a stern-sounding man with a slight southern draw, called. I'm heading to Chrome now, he said. I'll need as much information as you have about the situation. I told him all I knew. I hadn't been able to speak to my uncle since his arrival, so I couldn't offer much insight into his state of mind or how he might come across as a credible, at a credible uh, fear hearing an inquiry into his claims of persecution that would be held for an asylum officer at Chrome. Are you willing to take him in if they release him? Pratt asked. <clears throat> of course, I said. Hang on tight <clears throat> and then stay by the phone, he said. Once there, was, uh, once there was only waiting to do, my husband left for work. I called some Brooklyn Ambulant companies about transporting my father to Columbian Presbyterian the next day. My father had so little fat and muscle left on his body that it was agonizing for him to sit for any stretch of time, so I basically wanted to rent him a bed on wheels. 
The only way you get a bed is if you call 911, a Russian dispatcher told me, so I booked a van with a recliner. All morning I hoped that John Pratt would call and tell me that he was going to walk out of Chrome with my uncle, news I would have loved to share with my father. However, when Pratt did call that afternoon, the only news was that my uncle's credible fear hearing had been scheduled for 9 o'clock the next morning. So he's not coming home, I said. Even as, as I said it, the word home felt inappropriate, unsuitable. My uncle no longer had a home. Can I visit him, I asked. Only weekend visits are allowed at Chrome, he said, and he'd have to put you on a list a couple of days before the fact, but there's a good chance they'll release him tomorrow. That night around 6 o'clock, my uncle called me from Chrome. Bon day, he, I shouted, so overjoyed to hear that motorized, that motorized voice. My God, it's so good to hear you. Oh, I can't tell you how good it is to hear you, he said. Then I slipped into a, a repartee that I'd fallen into with my father in the last weeks or so as he'd grown sicker. I called him Cher, Amour, Mon Cor, Darling, My Love, My Heart. How are you, my heart? I'm non prison, he said. I'm in jail. Oh, I know, I said, now missing his real voice, the one that I that didn't always sound the same, the one I could no longer fully remember. I know, and I'm so sad. I'm so sad, sad and sorry for everything that's happened, both in Haiti and here. But you met with a lawyer? Yes, he said. Maxo and I both did. He's going to get you out, I said. He's a very good lawyer. He's going to get you out. Okay, he said. He'd had so many horrible surprises in the last few days. Why should he believe that things would start going well now? Ing nam prison, he said. Fo mash po oui. If you live long enough, you'll see everything. Don't worry, I said. We'll get you out. They, they took my medicine. The machine produced some static as if his finger had slipped off the button that he pressed to keep the voice going. I also had something for your father, some liquid vitamins. They took that too. And my papers, my notepads, they're gone, burned. Don't worry about all that, I said. Just concentrate on getting out tomorrow. Does he know? He asked. Does Mira know I'm in here? I didn't want him to know. He's so sick. I don't want him to have this on his mind. Don't worry, I said. He knows you're getting out tomorrow. Do people in Haiti know? He asked. He was most concerned about his sisters, Tant Z and Tantina. I think they know, I said. Now even the motorized voice betrayed a hint of shame, the kind of shame whose only reprieve is silence. I have to go, he said. Others are waiting. How do you feel, I asked. If you don't feel well, tell them. I will, he said. I have to go. I heard a muffled voice in the background, someone demanding a turn at the payphone. You're strong, I said. Very strong. You have so much more strength than even you know. <clears throat> And reluctantly, he agreed and said, oh, yes, it's true. <clears throat> Just get through tonight, I said. Tomorrow, God willing, you'll be free.